In the heart of Western Phoenix, amidst the hum of the city, stood the symbol of the Mellon family's prosperity, a series of golden arches. These weren't just any arches. They represented the family's legacy, a chain of McDonald's restaurants. At the helm of this legacy was Donald Mellon Jr., a man who seemed to embody the American dream. From the outside, Donald's life appeared picture perfect. Born into wealth and privilege, he was the kind of man who wore his responsibility with grace. He had a radiant smile that could light up a room and a heart that embraced the world. In his younger days, he was known for his boundless energy, often taking the lead during family gatherings and holding court at social events. He had found love early in life, marrying his college sweetheart. Together, they created a home filled with laughter, warmth, and the pitter-patter of three young children. The Mellons were the quintessential happy family, often spending weekends at their vacation home, where Donald would teach his children to fish and play ball. However, as is often the case, behind the facade of perfection lay hidden cracks. The pressures of maintaining the family empire, coupled with personal struggles, began to weigh on Donald. The walls of their beautiful home bore silent witness to whispered arguments and nights filled with tears. And one day, the whispers grew louder, leading to a painful divorce. Rebecca was a vibrant young woman, known for her carefree spirit and a desire for adventure. At first glance, she was just another girl who danced for a living and enjoyed a drink now and then. Donald, on the other hand, was older and had money. When they met, it seemed like a match made in heaven. He offered her financial stability, while she brought excitement and youth into his life. But what began as a fun, passionate relationship quickly turned more serious, leading them to tie the knot. Their friends described the early days of their marriage as electric, full of parties and laughter. But as time passed, cracks began to show. Rebecca's wild tendencies and the abundant alcohol in their home concerned those around them. Donald, once a grounded family man, transformed both in appearance and personality, becoming someone his family hardly recognized. The once responsible man, who was now nicknamed DJ by Rebecca, seemed to be following her down a reckless path. Alarmingly, their love for partying was rivaled only by their growing fascination with firearms, making even their closest friends uneasy about what the future held for that couple. Some thought Rebecca was the reason for his change, while others believed Donald was just trying to find himself again after his divorce. But everyone agreed that Donald wasn't the same anymore. The stable family man many knew seemed to be lost. On the evening of July 31st, 2012, a chilling call to 911 begins. The voice is that of Rebecca Mellon, a woman seemingly disoriented, her words stumbling over one another. The operator, trained for emergencies, grows increasingly frustrated as Rebecca's answers remain evasive and disjointed. What happened? The operator presses. Rebecca's response? A hauntingly vacant, I don't know, her narrative finding Donald bleeding and promptly calling 911. But a chilling voicemail and a living room camera tell a far grimmer tale. Donald's distraught daughters recall receiving a missed call and a voicemail from their father the night of the shooting. They listened to a haunting voicemail left from their father. They hear the exact moment their father met his end. The anguish in his voice, the chilling sound of a gunshot, paints a grisly picture, but the theory cannot be confirmed until they view the home surveillance footage. The home security captures the moments of that event. Rebecca, gun raised, shooting Donald, then calmly lighting a cigarette 
and watching as life slips away from her husband. For an agonizing 23 minutes, she sits, smokes, and watches. The night in question saw police rushing to the Mellon residence around 10 p.m., responding to an ambiguous distress call. Upon their arrival, the door remained unanswered, prompting them to force entry. What they discovered was a seemingly nonchalant Rebecca on the couch, a gun lying ominously beside her between couch cushions and her husband's lifeless body nearby. Strangely, in the wake of such a grisly scene, Rebecca was found dozing off in the backseat of a police car after being taken into custody. When roused and questioned, she appeared disoriented and claimed ignorance about the incident. According to her, she'd emerged from the bedroom to find Donald injured and immediately dialed 911. However, inconsistencies soon arose. Contrary to her claims of attending to his injuries, evidence suggested that she hadn't and her story saw minor, yet concerning, alterations as the night progressed. Rebecca did reveal that earlier in the evening there had been a violent altercation where Donald had allegedly thrown her, leaving visible bruises. Yet, she was reluctant about other aspects, like admitting to other people's presence in the house that day or revealing her husband's profession, which raised eyebrows. Through external interviews, police ascertained that four other individuals had been at the Mellon residence and departed shortly before the tragic incident. While the surveillance footage seems conclusive, revealing Rebecca's act without ambiguity, the story does not end there. As investigators search deeper into the cache of home videos, Startling revelations emerged, flipping the narrative on its head. Was this a straightforward case of cold-blooded murder, or were there layers yet to be peeled back? The unfolding saga promises more twists, turns, and challenges our perception of guilt and innocence. Rebecca, the former exotic dancer who had become center of Donald's world, is now the main suspect. Yet, as the news breaks, some come forward with a different story to tell. They speak of Rebecca as a woman trapped, abused, and tormented in her relationship with Donald. Jennifer Wilmot, Rebecca's defense attorney, soon takes on the case, determined to ensure her client's side of the story is heard. Wilmot paints a picture of a woman living in fear, a victim of domestic violence who acted in self-defense. There's more to this story than just that video, Wilmot argues. Why would Rebecca, after years of abuse, shoot just once, grazing Donald's head? If she truly wanted him dead, wouldn't she have ensured it, shooting him multiple times? As the defense pushes their case forward, they highlight the inconsistencies in Rebecca's behavior post-shooting, including the fact that she waited 23 minutes before calling 911, which they claim is evidence of her being in shock and not premeditation. Wilmot states Rebecca was inebriated that night and does not recall those fateful moments. The defense's claim gains traction when Rebecca herself speaks out in a televised interview with Crime Watch Daily's Anna Garcia. Rebecca, when you look at that videotape of you shooting your husband, mm -hmm. what do you think? I think it looks horrible, and it's, it just sucks because it's like I don't, I don't remember it happening. From behind bars, she reiterates her claim of being a battered woman, fearing for her life. She insists that on that same night, Donald had planned to have her killed. I didn't intend for the gun to go off, she says, tears streaming down her face. I just wanted to plead my case before he made that call. The twist in the tale sends shockwaves throughout the community. With many divided on the true nature of Rebecca's act, was it cold-blooded murder or the desperate act of a woman trapped in a cycle of violence? 
The aftermath of Donald's death and Rebecca's arrest tears apart not only their families, but also the community. The sordid story of love, lust, alcohol, and death dominates headlines. As the court proceedings get underway, it's clear that this trial will be about more than just the facts. It will explore the darkest corners of human relationships and the lengths people will go to when they feel cornered. Donald's family remains convinced of Rebecca's guilt. His daughter, Darcy Mellon, lashes out against Rebecca's claims of abuse. It's just another one of her tales, another excuse, Darcy says with clear disdain in her eyes. She firmly believes that justice would be Rebecca spending a lifetime behind bars. Donald's ex-wife, Karen, remembers the Donald she once knew, a far cry from the DJ that he had become. He wasn't this man being portrayed. Rebecca has always painted herself as a victim, but she is anything but, she says, her voice filled with sorrow and anger. Yet, as Rebecca stands before the Maricopa County judge, another piece of evidence becomes crucial. The video after the shooting, which shows Rebecca calmly smoking while her husband lies bleeding, counters her defense's claim of a mere act of self-defense. If the case had proceeded to court, Rebecca's defense would have highlighted her husband Donald's alleged abusive past. She asserted that her actions were driven by self-defense. You have the ability and the concentration to sit down and have a cigarette. And based mm -hmm. on the video, it appeared like you were watching. Yeah, I didn't even, I didn't remember even smoking or any of that. And I didn't come back into focus until I saw him um, on the couch. What's wrong with him? Can you be more specific? He's bleeding. According to Rebecca, Donald's possessiveness dominated her life, leading to multiple instances of physical violence, including hitting, choking, and pushing her down. On two occasions, authorities arrested Donald for assault. He's planning to end my life, Rebecca had once informed the authorities after one such arrest. She further alleged that Donald had plans to have her murdered, intending to disguise it as a failed burglary. On July 31st, 2012, the couple was embroiled in arguments throughout the day. A close acquaintance mentioned that Rebecca had been consuming alcohol that day. She informed the authorities that on that fateful afternoon, Donald had forcefully thrown her across their living room. Later that day, she recalls him tossing her a firearm from his personal collection. Puzzled, she recalled asking, Why are you giving this to me? His chilling response was, It might come in handy someday. Rebecca explained to the court that she believed Donald was initiating the planned staged robbery over the phone. Overwhelmed with fear, she recounted grabbing the firearm, entering the room, and discharging it. The subsequent events, she professed, were a blur to her. The evidence proves too damning. Rather than facing a jury and risking a life sentence, Rebecca ended up taking a plea deal admitting to second-degree murder and was sentenced to 20 years in prison. As Rebecca was escorted away, her steps faltered. Her gaze seeking out her son, the words, I love you, formed on her lips. A silent testament to an unbreakable bond. And even as the door swung closed, cutting her off from the world she knew, her eyes remained fixed on him, holding on to that last moment of connection. The tragedy has left scars on both sides. While Rebecca spends her days behind bars grappling with the weight of her actions, Donald's family mourns the loss of a loved one and strives to challenge the narrative surrounding his death. The heartbreaking tale of Rebecca and Donald Mellon stands as a haunting testament to the hidden agonies that can fester in seemingly ordinary homes. A life taken, a family torn apart, and questions that echo through the corridors of time. You've walked with us through their story, felt the weight of their choices and circumstances, 
We pause now to ask you, what do you think? Were there signs, opportunities missed, shadows of doubt? While we cannot undo the past for Donald, nor completely understand Rebecca's actions, we can strive to ensure others don't walk that same darkened path. It becomes our shared duty to be watchful, to support, to intervene, and above all, to listen with an open heart. Let the melon story be a poignant reminder. We need to tirelessly combat domestic violence and advocate for environments where trust, respect, and safety prevail. We must remember that behind every story are individuals, lives interwoven with dreams, hopes, fears, and regrets. The narrative of Rebecca and Donald is a stark call to action, to not only mourn for Donald, but to be the change, the listening ear, the helping hand that might save another. Let's work towards a world where Every person, regardless of their circumstances, feels seen, heard, and most importantly, safe.